lift lift your lift your eye line up a bit for us if you can or, or camera down that's perfect that's perfect that's perfect great good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to you. learning your lunchtime uh, webinar we have a very special guest today i'm absolutely looking forward to chatting with uh, natasha frank about psychometrics uh, so great to see everybody already jumping on board. Good vibes, good vibes, good vibes. And uh, right at the outset, we do just want to say that our thoughts and prayers are out there to anybody that's been affected by what's going on in the country. Mm -hmm. And we're absolutely sensitive to the challenges that people are facing as a result of these issues. Uh, but we also do recognize the importance of, you know, keeping uh, initiatives like this going and learning and giving up people opportunities to uplift themselves and, uh, you know, to take action, you know, as a result of things that they learn so that they can move forward and be successful uh, in their journey. So, guys, uh, please just mention in the chat, you know, where you're from, which universities, you know, let you know about the session today. And then, of course, specific questions about psychometrics. It's such an interesting a topic that we're going to be getting into today and I'm going to give Natasha a, a chance to introduce herself and give us some of her background about you know, what she does in the space and what services she's offering and as always it's great that people like Natasha give us you know their time in these sessions but then I would also you know urge you if you need assistance if you need support invest you know in the services of people like Natasha and Tracy that we've had previously uh, and I'll certainly post their, their contact details onto the chat a little bit later. Great to see Tux, University Western Cape, fantastic to have you guys. Looks like we're getting a good uh, group of people going. UKZN, Lungani, hope everything is okay there with you guys. You know, thoughts and prayers out to you guys. I know, for example, FNB, we send in a couple of cargo planes and trucks down there as well. So we've been working hard this week uh, just to try and support as much as we can. Northern Cape, University of Johannesburg, Salt Plyke, fantastic. And University of Johannesburg, uh, Cape Peninsula, University of Technology, um, Tux, fantastic. University of Johannesburg, good, good cross section of people today. So, Natasha, a warm welcome. And why don't you introduce yourself and, and let us know your experience in this interesting world of, of psychometrics and assessments? Go for it. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much for um, for having me. So. Look, I mean, just 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 a brief background. I am a uh, psychometrist by profession. I'm registered with the Health Professions Council. And uh, interestingly enough, when I say to people I'm a psychometrist, I'm generally met with the response, well, you know, what is a psychometrist? Um, you know, people know about uh, psychologists, but essentially psychometrist is somebody who works with psychological assessments to assess different um, psychological attributes. Um, assessments can be used across a range of um, a range of, well, there's a range of purposes in using assessments from kind of recruitment and selection processes. And I think that's probably what students are most interested in. But yeah, so I'm, I'm a psychometrist by profession. Um, I've, I've worked in the world of corporate for nearly a decade and about three or four years ago, decided to venture out on my own. I'm presently working um, in independent practice and really just helping people figure out their next steps when it comes to career decisions. So from choosing subjects when you're in grade nine um, to, you know, making choices about studies and then also just, you know, as you transition from university into the world of work, navigating that space. And that's really sort of where a lot of my background and experience uh, lies. I've, I've worked um, for, for nearly a decade, sort of helping young people navigate the world of work as they leave university. And I think it's really just been sort of a culmination of my corporate experience and listening to the stories of so many of these young people that I decided um, career development is really the space that I want to play in and helping people figure out their next steps. That's fantastic, Natasha. And we have, you know, the sessions when we talk about workplace readiness and given the challenges we've had, you know, over the last year or so, and we've got, you know, a huge group of, of, of students in the student success uh, coach community, and people are just a little bit worried. You know, we've had mental health challenge, you know, uh, webinars talking about those sort of issues of isolation, et cetera. People are worried about the demand of the careers that they've chosen and the degrees that they're, you know, now, you know doing and worried whether they should change track 
you know, how they can position themselves for the workplace. But so Natasha, you know, what are some of the sort of biggest questions that you get in your practice and in your sort of day-to-day -day consultation with students that's the most common that maybe we can just start working through a little bit of a series of themes and concepts that, you know, sort of breaks down this world of psychometrics testing and maybe starts to answer some of the questions that people would have or anticipate, uh, you know, as they get into the workplace and the assessments that will start coming at them as they try to get jobs. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think, Peter, um, one of the things that I that I want to highlight or emphasize for students is really the importance of a personal brand. Um, you know, one of the questions that 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 I like to put out there is that, you know, if there's any brand that you could identify with in the market, what would that brand be? And, you know, we're met with a number of responses. Um, you know, students will often say, you know, the likes of maybe Google or Apple or Adidas or, you know, some of these brands, but they're well known. And the, the, the response to that question is, well, how many of you want to be a no-name brand? Because I'm never met with the response of, I just want to be a no-name brand. And essentially, that is what you can end up being if you don't pay attention to who you are. Um, what are your strengths? What are you good at? Because as a student, you're so um, often focused on your academics, which is understandable. That is really an important facet of being at university. You want to make sure that you meet the requirements of assignments, you study for exams, and you, you, know, you, you get the best marks possible. But often it's with the, um, you know, it, it, it's with losing focus on who am I and how am I going to stand out in the market? Because many students are going to be um, known for, for their marks. A lot of other students are doing the same thing, focusing on their academics. And one of the things that psychometrics helps with, and it's not the only tool, but it is really around creating some time and reflection to understand, um, you know, what are your strengths? What are the things you're good at? What are the things you're interested in? What else are you doing outside of university? Um, so there's definitely a focus around thinking about what is your personal brand, enhancing and developing that personal brand so that you can communicate that effectively when you are sitting with employers, et cetera, and in interviews. And I know Tracy would speak to a lot of these, um, a lot of these aspects. But that's that's definitely one of the things we pick up with young people. And I think also because we're living in a world where, you know, information is accessed at at, at the tip of our fingertips, you know, it's it's right there. We spend a lot of our time in our devices. We don't actually take a step back um, to just slow things down, um, to pause, to think about, you know, who am I? What is going on for me um, intellectually, emotionally? And these are all things that really contribute to having a credible personal brand because when you're sitting in an interview for example and you get the question tell me about yourself you need to have quite a polished answer and you can't tell anyone about yourself if you don't know about yourself absolutely and tell me natasha i mean that sort of grounded um thinking that you're talking about there of just getting your center you know removing the distractions in your life the devices and the worry and the concerns etc Personal branding is part of it, but and we've had, you know, psychologists on previously that have given people that advice of, you know, trying to orientate themselves to their personal mission and the way they want to move forward in life. I mean, if people spend time investing in that and ensuring that they are grounded and centered in what they want to do and how they want to represent themselves to the world through a personal brand, as you've given them the advice to do so today, that type of grounding and maturity and outlook on life is going to reflect in a positive psychometric assessment of that person. I mean, this is now, when, when we talk about psychometrics, you know, companies are using these very well thought through instruments to get a clear and scientific picture of a person that's sitting in front of them in an interview or sent them a CV, um, you know, in a job application process. So investing time in doing that is going to reflect in a positive psychometric assessment process. And there's a lot of science that has gone into that. I mean, you've made a, a career effectively out about helping people to navigate through that world. So maybe make the link there for us between the psychometric assessment process and the importance of students going into it 
you know, with that 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 grounded personal branding mindset and approach to to, to getting a job? Because it's not just a, a shotgun approach of getting whatever job they can possibly lay their hands on. It's about thoughtfully approaching, you know, employers with that well thought through mindset. Look, absolutely, Peter. So, I mean, I think, you know, just maybe taking a step back, we've t- we've, 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 we've been using this term psychometrics and I, I maybe just want to clarify when we say psychometrics, what, what is psychometrics? And despite its popularity, because like you've said, a lot of employers are making use of psychometrics. Um, despite its popularity, the subject's the subject actually remains quite a mystery for many. And I think in its its simplest term, the word psychometrics um, you know gives give, gives gives meaning to 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 the definition. So if we break up the word, psycho really has to do with the mind. And when we talk about metrics, it's measuring um, things. So essentially, psychometrics is measuring aspects relating to the mind. And so when we talk about, you know, what is the link between that um, and a personal brand? So, you know, there are different things that can be measured using a psychometric. And I'm sure for students, perhaps having completed psychometrics, often you may be faced with um, a psychometric assessment that measures your abilities. So that could be your verbal ability or your your numerical ability. Um, and employers use make use of these tools. Well, good employers will, will make use of these tools because they want to ensure that the candidate that they're employing is a right fit for the role. And in saying that, it's not just a one um, a one-way process. So for students, employers are taking the time to invest in using these tools to make sure that they find the right candidate. It is a two-way process because it's also determining for yourself if that environment and that role is the right fit for you. So coming back to your question, Peter, around having that sense of awareness of who I am. So for example, when you're completing a psychometric assessment that is going to assess ability, like verbal ability or numerical ability, that's really around trying to understand, can you perform the tasks of the role? But in addition to ability assessments, employers will quite often assess one's personality. And when we talk about personality, those are behavioral preferences. And a lot of, when it comes to personality, there is no right or wrong, but self-awareness plays such an important role because it is an awareness of what are my preferences? How do I enjoy interacting with people? How do I enjoy making sense of my world? How do I organize my world? You know, am I quite structured and methodical? Um, Do I enjoy engaging with people or do I gain a lot of my energy being by myself? Do I like looking at big, at the big picture? Do I like focusing on the detail? And a lot of this comes, this awareness comes with being able to be in touch with who you are. So when you're completing a personality assessment, for example, those are what we call self-report questionnaires. It's based on your understanding of yourself. And again, if there's limited self-awareness, you're not going to be representing yourself, um, I think, to the best of your ability. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you, Natasha. That is such valuable insight. And guys, I put a couple of links on the chat there. So the first one is just subscribe to the YouTube channel. And there's lots of coaching tips there and updates and previous webinars that you'll be able to take a lot of advantage from and get access to experts like Natasha and Tracy and others who we've had, which will help you, you know, to prepare for things like psychometrics and many other aspects of job searching and workplace readiness and then of course as natasha was talking about you know just you know centering yourself and the self-awareness we've got mentors and we've got people available in that facebook group there Uh, we've had a new mentor sign up this week actually so if you need that more um, collaborative you know insight and support from people from other students uh, please do jump into the Facebook group there and, uh, you know, join in and get the help that you need. Natasha, just such a great question here from from Asif. Uh, you know, it's on the screen there, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, I guess top question is, you know, what is a psychometric assessment? And then secondly, you know, how can we prepare for them? So, you know, I guess the word test, you know, implies that there is yes. a way that you can prepare. And, and maybe that's a misnomer, but maybe just help people at least anticipate or think through or, get ready for psychometric tests in answer to a CIF there? 
Okay. So, yes, look, I mean, these are definitely one of the most popular questions that I often get. You know, I've got an assessment that I've got to complete as part of a selection process. How do I prepare for this? And I think, you know, there's there's a couple of things. There's a couple of things that people need to do. And I'll probably touch on this a little bit later in our discussion around what are the rights of people who are participating in assessments. But, you know, so often um, students are requested to do psychometric assessments and you have no idea the assessment that you're going to be completing. So the first thing I would say in terms of your preparation is to get as much information as possible about the assessment. Um, and when we talk about assessment processes or selection processes, a psychometric assessment is just one step in that process. You are being assessed from the time you put your CV together from the time you submit that application online or on that employer's portal, you're being assessed in an interview. Um, so just to, to, you know, to clarify that a psychometric assessment is only one step in the process and it is important that you are making a good impression throughout the process. Um, and that you're also conveying a consistent message. So whatever you've said in your CV around your experience and your background, often, there's layers of that that are now being assessed in a psychometric assessment. So if you've said, you know what, I've got a background, I've, I've studied um, perhaps something in commerce or finance. So one would make the assumption that you have reasonable numerical ability. And when that is being assessed in a psychometric assessment, we want to ensure that that is consistent with the information that you've put in your CV. So how can I prepare for psychometric assessments? Firstly, get as much information as possible about the assessment that you're completing. So when a recruiter says we want you to complete um, assessments, here's some online links, and that's more the case of how it's being done these days through, through an online platform, you know, ask the recruiter, well, what is the assessment? What is being assessed? Is it going to be my ability? Is it my personality? Is it my interests? Is it my values? So get as much information about the assessment, the name of the assessment. Um, is it going to be a timed assessment? Is, you know, do, do you have access to data and Wi-Fi? Are you going to be able to complete it um, in one sitting and not be interrupted? So, yes, get as much information. You can also ask the recruiter, OK, well, um, do you know if I can practice or prepare in any way? And often when you have an idea of, OK, well, it's an abilities assessment and they're going to be assessing perhaps my verbal reasoning or my numerical reasoning, you may actually find practice examples available online. So I think coming back to your point, Peter, when we talk about, when we use the word test, there's definitely languaging associated with that, you know, being a pass or a fail. That is why I like to use the term assessment. So, you know, when it comes to abilities assessments, there are um, right or wrong responses because we're assessing your ability here. We want to understand how much of something do you understand? Or we want to evaluate how much of something do you understand? When it comes to personality, like I said, there are no right or wrong personalities, but it's ensuring that you know who you are and you're communicating that with, with authenticity and consistency. So make sure you've got enough information, go and do some research online, see if there are practice examples. Um, so when we talk, talk about verbal reasoning, that's really trying to understand how do you solve problems with written material? Um, often you may get a scenario and then you may have to answer some questions relating to that scenario, you know, um, true or fal false or I, I cannot say or I there wasn't enough information. So it's how do you make sense of the information that was provided to you in a written, um, in a written kind of capacity when we talk about numerical reasoning i mean that is around solving problems that have to do with numbers so yes get enough information see if they practice examples that are available um, when it comes down to the nitty-gritty unfortunately you cannot prepare so it's not like you know your 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 university exams or your matric exams where you could get mock papers or mock assignments because that's really in some ways, defeating the purpose of what really needs to be done. You can't jip out the system or cheat the system. Um, you're never going to have access to the exact questions. And again, it's about finding that fit. So are you a right fit for the role? 
is the employer a right fit um, for you? So that is around preparation before you actually complete the assessment. You know, during the assessment or on the day of the assessment, I say to people, make sure that you've had a good night's rest, um, that you've slept well. When you are going to be taking the assessment, often when we're nervous, we find that our mouth becomes dry. So make sure that you're hydrated, you've got some water next to you, and that you can actually complete the assessment in one sitting and that it is um, uninterrupted. And if you've done your research before, if you've had the opportunity to do practice examples, you know, when you're sitting there doing the assessment there and then, it actually takes away some of those nerves. You feel a, you feel better prepared, you feel more confident. I mean, there's nothing wrong with getting information and asking questions. I think so often students panic because they're afraid to go back and ask, what is this about? What am I going to be assessed on? Um, yes, and I will also touch on the responsibility of professionals like me in the market um, as to how those assessments are actually administered. Great, Natasha, thank you so much. And I'd love to get to that topic around rights and responsibilities that you mentioned just now. But when people talk about, you know, passing or failing, and we've got a couple of comments in the chat there where people were, let's say, unsuccessful. I just want to go back to what you're saying about uh, companies using a psychometric assessment to determine the fit for their organization. So they'll have created, let's call it maybe a profile of what they believe is a good fit in their organization. And they'll assess you in comparison to that definition of the employee that they want to bring to the organization. So it's not an objective pass or fail, it's relative to the organization's definition of how well you will fit into their culture. So you could do the exact same psychometric assessment on a shared platform at one organization and not be, let's say, successful in terms of being offered a job, but complete it in the same way at another organization and be successful because the fit that the company is requiring is different um, between the two organizations. So it's actually in both people's interests to do these properly and to take the time and energy to go through them because ultimately will result in better career success for you and the company's value that they'll get from you because they've got the right fit into their organization. Yeah, I mean, that's that's spot on, um, Peter. So, you know, often um, students, when you're applying and perhaps there's a profile on the website or, um, you know, the, the requirements of the role will be listed into the job description. And like you've mentioned, and I've also said, it is about finding that right fit. And often when you go through a job description, the things that you will be assessed on is generally found under that section called competencies. And those are sort of a group of behaviors and abilities that are required for high performance in that role. So um, Betze, I'm looking at your question there about, you know, well, why do we get feedback that we've failed the assessment? Um, I think, you know, the language around that, I would be quite surprised if somebody actually said, well, you've failed. Um, it mm -hmm. comes back to the requirements of the role. So it is about, and it's also familiarizing yourself with the competencies listed in the job description. You know, sometimes these competencies would be things like, you know, being able to pay attention to detail, being able to organize and to plan, being able to communicate effectively. And when we talk about different assessment methods, like I'd mentioned, there are your psychometric assessments that will perhaps sometimes look at things like your abilities. Um, it may look at your personality. Um, I'm not sure if people have participated in assessment centers, but those are also exercises um, that are either sometimes done um, as part of a group exercise, sometimes it's uh, a presentation, and that is now being able to observe those behaviors or those competencies that are important for the role. So again, it comes back to there isn't a pass or a fail. And I think students, it's just to also empower you firstly to get the information and to make sure that you are a fit for this role. If you know that you are somebody who enjoys crunching numbers and working with the detail and making sense and finding and so and finding answers and solving problems in that way, and that is what energizes you. If you are applying for a role, for example, that is going to require you to be engaging with people 80% of your day, um, doing presentations, um, you know, maybe you may not get access to interacting with the numbers as much as you enjoy. Sure, perhaps you can perform that role, 
but it's not going to be the right fit for you. And I also want to distinguish between preference and proficiency. So when we talk about personality assessment, we're really trying to understand your behavioral preferences. Some of these things that I spoke about, you know, what is your preference for interacting with people? What is your preference for taking in information? But it doesn't mean that you cannot be proficient. Um, so we also don't use our personality as an excuse for doing or not doing certain things, exhibiting or, you know, limiting certain behaviors. We we have a preference for certain things. And when it comes to making sure that you fit the role in the environment, it is about being in alignment with our preferences. Um, and it's not always necessarily around proficiency. Proficiency are things that we can grow at. We can become more proficient to deliver presentations. We can become more proficient um, at, you know, crunching the numbers. But it, again, it's about what is going to give you going to think yes, you can get the job but you can be frustrated in two months feel despondent want to change careers think that you made the wrong decision and you're back in the market yeah fantastic natasha i really love that uh, insight there so just to recap then and and i mean i want to move on to the rights and responsibilities we had a great question there about mental health but to answer is initially there might be right or better fit and wrong or not so good fit as a result of how you respond in an, a psychometric assessment and again it's very specific to the individual and the company and the culture and the role and the and the fit that they're trying to trying to assess so just to to finish off on this one and i mean i think um, good dc you know also you know can you game these these tests and i mean they are scientifically designed to you know catch that type of thing and they'll use multiple different questions to triangulate and determine whether you actually answering it in the way that you think it should be answered versus what is a genuine reflection of your proficiency your preferences your level of self-awareness and all the other aspects um you know that psychometric tests sort of build into them natasha i mean you mentioned platforms earlier on but you know these tests are the result of extensive study and you know people who have dedicated their, their lives into to assessing people very very in a very sophisticated means so actually gaming it could actually be put you at more of a disadvantage potentially. Absolutely. So, you know, I also want to make the distinction between um, a psychometric assessment, what constitutes a psychometric assessment versus kind of a questionnaire you may find on the internet. So when it comes to the Health Professions Council um, here in South Africa, there are a list of what we call classified um, assessments, and they've gone through quite a rigorous process um, to be classified as a psychometric assessment that is suitable to be used um, in the South African context, because there are a number of assessments, and psychometrics in South Africa has some of its history entrenched in being used unfairly um, during kind of the era uh, of apartheid. And the Employment Equity Act specifically mentions that psychometric assessments are only to be used if they have been deemed to be fair, um, you know, that they can be applied fairly across the population, um, that they are reliable and valid, um, and that it doesn't discriminate, you know, against any any kind of group. So a psychometric assessment, like you said, there's been a lot of research. Um, it's not something that just happens overnight. There are psychometric principles that have to be found um, within that, that assessment to be deemed a psychometric. So we speak about things around reliability and validity of the assessment, but you've touched on that when we speak about the reliability and that there are mechanisms placed, um, there are mechanisms in the assessment to see, is the candidate trying to um, sort of put themselves forward in a more positive light? Um, mm. Is the candidate perhaps overly critical on their on the assessment of their ability? So we have what we call negative impression scales, positive impression scales. There are also things built into the assessment that looks at the consistency of answers. So I've seen a couple of the comments here. And generally, you know, when you get the instruction to complete something like a personality ass assessment, firstly, it helps to know who you are, so to be self-aware. And secondly, to answer 
those questions honestly, not how you think the employer would want you to answer those questions because you're doing yourself a disservice and you are compromising the fit, you know, compromising um, the suitability or fit of that role, whether you would fit that role and whether that role is suitable um, for you. So it is important to answer those questions honestly and authentically because there are scales built into a lot of those assessments that will flag, hmm, this particular candidate answered this question, sort of, you know, uh, for example, saying that they enjoy interacting with people most of the time. And then there's this question where they've said, I don't really, you know, I prefer to be by myself. So there's, there's inconsistency. Definitely context plays a role. Um, but yeah, it is important. So with a psychometric assessment, we've got those things in place because there's been a lot of research that has gone into classifying that assessment, making sure that it's reliable, making sure that it's valid. There um, are what we call norm studies, make sure, making sure that it is suitable for the population that is completing that. So, I mean, you'll have uh, norms age norms, gender norms, cultural norms. Um, and if you're just going to do a pop quiz on the internet, you're not going to get the same kind of um, objectivity. Mm. Uh, Natasha, I mean, Catherine raises a good point there. And I mean, there is a bit of a sentiment in the chat that sometimes these could be, you know, used in the wrong way by employers just to make it difficult. And we would sort of trust and hope that if they are registered and properly vetted, processes and instruments with the health professions council as you mentioned then it should be trustworthy but i think catherine's point is quite valid that there should be some sort of feedback process or some sort of mechanism by way of sort of a follow-up of some sort bearing in mind what we said earlier it's not a right or wrong objective process it's an assessment relative to the company's culture but just in terms of the standard trusted verified process is there a mechanism for some type of feedback to people who have done psychometric uh, tests as part of a, a job application process definitely peter so um so this actually brings me to the rights and responsibilities um, of both participants as well as professionals involved in administering, um, scoring, um, you know, and reporting back on, on these assessments. So, you know, this is the one thing I definitely do want to share with students is to be aware of your rights as, um, as somebody participating in an assessment. And feedback is definitely one of those aspects. So it is important. I'm actually I actually made a couple of notes here and I just want to make sure that I don't miss any of them. So firstly, it's important that when you are completing a psychometric assessment, that it is done within the context of a professional relationship with somebody that is registered with the Health Professions Council if you are completing a psychometric assessment. Um, because, you, you know, in terms of the ethics that govern um, this particular profession, they are very clear ways of administering um, assessments. So it is important that when you are completing one, it is done within the context of a professional relationship and students, participants, clients, you have every right to verify the identity and qualifications of that professional to make sure that this is um, somebody who is qualified to perform these assessments. The next thing um, that is important is this concept of, or this, 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 um, this requirement of informed consent. When you are participating in a psychometric assessment, it is important that you are giving your informed consent, which says, um, I understand why I am completing this assessment. I understand what is going to happen with my assessment results. Um, and you know, if my results are going to be shared with someone else outside of this process, I want to be informed prior. So it is about understanding, getting the information and giving your cons giving your consent to participate. Um, there's also confidentiality that is involved. And I think, you know, now with um, Papaya having been um, implemented at the beginning of this month, that is even more so a requirement around how are my results and my information going to be stored and handled. So you have every right to ask questions pertaining to confidentiality, um, to understand, uh, you know, how will your results be used? What are the recommendations that are going to be um, made on the basis of that assessment? And then when we come to the question of a feedback session, 
So this is where it becomes a little bit gray when assessments are used within the con or used for selection purposes. So within my practice, I'm I, I prefer to use assessments purely for development purposes to help people understand themselves, um, to understand their strengths, the areas for development so that they can improve. In the context of a recruitment process where the employer is requesting for you to um, to complete assessments, you actually do have right to feedback. Um, but often that the full scope of that feedback is attached to um, a commensurate fee being charged for that feedback being delivered by the professional. But at the very least, I do think that you should have access to um, a feedback report where the results are explained to you in a way that is understandable, where it's not technical, where you know you're not going to be um, seeing sort of scores that you don't understand. It's got to be conveyed to you in, um, in in terms that you can understand. And then again, coming back to one of the the last rights is around understanding that you actually have the right to refuse participation but that you're also aware of the consequences of that refusal. So if you say, well, actually, I don't want to participate in this assessment, the psychometric assessment, you have every right to say that. But understanding that if you don't want to participate, that may be a key leg in the broader selection process for that employer. And you may then be um, you know, eliminating yourself from that process. So you definitely have access to feedback or at least some kind of report um, that is definitely the rights of, of a client and professionals who are um, part of this industry would know that if a client has taken the time to complete an assessment, they should have access to their results and the feedback. But like I said, it becomes a bit gray um, when there's a recruitment process involved because, you know, who's paying for that feedback um, feedback session? Is it the employer? Okay. Is it the candidate? <laughs> Great. Thanks, Natasha. So I think that brings us maybe just to the question here, which you know, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about. And you did mention earlier that you run a practice and you obviously use things like the psychometric assessments that we're talking about today for developmental processes for people to just mature and develop as individuals and professionals entry in the workplace. But Zota asks, you know, how can people get in touch with you? How can they work with you? How can they book an appointment and invest, you know, in maybe an hour consultation with you? Is that something? Something that you offer what can you offer people and, and how could people get in touch with you Natasha so you can always pop me a mail you can go through to my website which is www.natashafrank.co.za um, drop me a line or you can pop me an email which you'll also find on um, my LinkedIn profile but my email is essentially tash at natashafrank.co.za um, and yes I you know I I make use of psychometric assessments, but it's not the only tool and mechanism. And for me, what I enjoy about psychometric assessments is that it provides, um, there's, there's a scientific basis and an objective lens to be able to make sense of, um, you know, psychological constructs. So understanding our aptitude, understanding our values, understanding our interests, there's an objective and scientific way to gather all of that information. But I like to sort of combine that with more of a narrative approach to understand people's stories. Um, you know, we are unique, we're individuals. So it's combining that objective information with understanding the story behind each individual. You know, what was what was the role that um, teachers played in your in your upbringing? What was the influence of parents or caregivers? Um, you know, what are some of the stories that have influenced you to getting to this point? Why did you choose a BCom uh, law degree, but you're not sure if you want to be a lawyer? So this is kind of where the self-awareness, the taking a pause, taking time out to reflect um, on who you are comes in really handy and informs your next step. Um, yeah. Informs, informs and helps you to make uh, decisions regarding the next step in your career. Great, Natasha. I'm just popping your website up there so people can have a quick have a look there. And um, so, 100%. You know, you can see everything that you need to there. A little bit more around uh, mm -hmm. Natasha. So, thank you very much for that. And um, you know, you can book a, a call there. 
and find out a lot more about uh, you know what Natasha has to offer. But wonderful again that she makes that uh, wisdom available for us today um, in this webinar and also giving everybody the chance to sort of ask uh, some questions um, and uh, learn a little bit before they then sort of you know go into this in a little bit more detail um, with you, Natasha. So anything else that you just want to point out in terms of your services and your website and the value that you provide to people um, in terms of, uh, you know, hopping on to natashafrank.co.za and then picking up a, a consultation or a, or a next step with you thereafter? So, I mean, Peter, I think just for me, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a strong advocate around doing things on purpose um, and being aligned to your purpose. So, so often, I think also just living in this world of busyness, um, numerous distractions, uh, you know, constantly being buried in our electronic devices, we don't take the time out to actually be aware of, to, 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 to be aware of what's going on around us and what's happening inside of us. So our careers, those choices have to be intentional um, and it's completely up to you. Nobody else can drive your career except for you. And I've learned a lot of these lessons, some, some, um, some easier lessons, some hard lessons throughout my career around taking ownership and being intentional. But I think for me, it's really around being intentional and figuring out what is your purpose. You know, what actually excites you? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? Um, and Purpose is not kind of a once off destination. I say to people, it is a series of moments um, and, and being open to the possibilities and putting yourself out there. But a lot of it starts with knowing who you are. It's doing the me work um, that, that, that is going to take you forward. Oh, I love that, Natasha. And uh, also just to reemphasize that uh, Natasha and Tracy and Kathy and lots of the guests that we've had on these webinars previously, you know, all participate in our sort of very active student community inside the Facebook group, the Student Success Coach. You know, so whether you want to bounce these ideas off other students uh, or see future events that are coming up or get access and resources such as Natasha's website, um, as well as the recording from today's webinar. It's all available inside the Facebook group. Uh, plus, you know, Natasha's phone number and email address are up there and available on her website for you to get in touch with her. And, uh, you know, Zota, as you were asking just now, um, you know, get some guidance around whether, um, you know, you, you should sort of, uh, you know, change track in terms of your career. I think you mentioned that you were doing, um, you know, the legal profession and now maybe having um, second thoughts about that. Um, then I just want to touch on Onka Betz's question. Did you check the FMB program, check graduate programs at Careers Portal? So not sure that everybody knows. I work at FMB. Um, so yes, we have a very um, active graduate program. And I know that, uh, you know, we are 100% certified and compliant with all the principles and rights and responsibilities that, that Natasha was talking about. And we, we bring in, you know, a fair number of graduates every year. Uh, we have a lot of programs, you know, that people can get access to um, on our website. And, and most definitely get in touch with Natasha, you know, if you want to maximize the preparation and the thinking process before you go through uh, the type of graduate program that we offer and the assessments like psychometrics and others that we'll use uh, to make sure that you're the right fit for us coming into the organization. And I've been at First Rand and FMB for 10 years, and I can, you know, certainly vouch for the importance of going into an organization where there is uh, a mutual benefit, and I think this was the point raised in one of the, the, the chats earlier, that these really aren't or shouldn't be intended just as, as making it difficult. They are intended to, to start the relationship, the working relationship with your employer off on the right track, you know, from the beginning. And I think we spoke last week with Tracy about just a bit of a job search strategy. And, uh, you know, you certainly don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And we've seen on the chat as well, Capitech is different, difficult, or NetBank is difficult. And that job search strategy that Tracy spoke about, you know, last week, um, you know, psychometrics and assessments are going to be part of that. But, but make sure you sort of spread, you know, the risk a little bit in terms of your options and work through a range. You know, you should have a number of companies that you're keen to, to get into and start a career with. And that just then means you're not totally dependent on, on one step in one process at one company, but to lucky there 
Um, you know, thank you for the feedback. Glad this is informative. You know, this is really the focus of the student success coach. Um, and, uh, you know, we will continue to, to, to work hard to bring you great sessions. In actual fact, we've got Tracy next Friday uh, talking about how to maximize LinkedIn. Uh, you know, that's something that comes up very, very often and a very important uh, tool, I think, in job search and networking and profiling uh, to be successful uh, in the workplace. So, Natasha, just, uh, you know, looking at a couple of these um, uh, questions coming through over here, um, you know, the, the, the sort of earlier stage, and we've spoken all about the university and getting into the workplace and so on, but, um, you know, what about at the matriculants level that help them decide getting into degrees and so on? I mean, that career counseling, you know, we've had Hannes Vessels previously on one of the webinars, you know, talking about, you um, uh, career counseling and the, the services that he provides, you know, from a career choice perspective. But is there a role of psychometric tests in terms of the, the degree choice at that early stage in people's careers? Yeah, absolutely, Peter. So, I mean, one of the things that 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 I often I've also mentioned is around there's definitely psychometric assessments that you can do um, kind of at, at, a, at a grade nine um sort of level in terms of choosing subjects and you know the, the the interesting thing about our career is that your career starts when you're probably around three or four and you have an awareness of the fact that people have jobs and they have to make a living and it sort of starts at that young age when people ask you you know what do you want to be when you grow up and you say i want to be a policeman or a fireman and that's really when our awareness of careers actually starts but it progresses um and you know from as from as early as grade nine making sure that you choose the right subjects and being informed every step of the way, um, understanding what the world of work has to offer. So, you know, we've spoken a lot about having an awareness of who I am and how I show up in the market. But the second leg, and this is quite a critical, critical step in the process of being able to be successful in your career, is doing research about the market. Um, doing research about the organizations that interest you. And I mean, Tracy, I'm sure has mentioned this um, a number of times, and it's something that is quite important. So yes, there are definitely assessments that can be done at a gra grade nine um, stage, assessments that can be done in grade 11, assessments that can be done um, in, in grade 12, assessments whilst you're at university, just to be able to help you gather as much information about yourself. Um, and look, I mean, there's definitely a cost attached to assessments, but I do say to young people, I think just taking the time and, you know, journaling may sound a little bit like, oh, that's so boring. Like, do I really want to journal? Do I want to get a book and a pen out and actually write things? But, you know, there's there's some there's some really cool apps. Um, I, I, I mentioned um, Penzu to a lot of clients who want to do things on an electronic kind of space. It's an online journal platform. But, you know, it's, 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 it's being aware of what are the things that interest you, even when you're watching a movie. What are the movies that excite you and interest you um, and why do they interest you and you know what gets you involved so it's not just about using a psychometric assessment but you know take an awareness of what are the kinds of books that you read if you read if you had to go into a store maybe not right now but you know magazines what magazines what articles interest you it gives you an indication of you know, do I enjoy reading business articles? Maybe I have an interest in pursuing a field of study related to business and commerce. Or am I drawn to shows involved with helping people, for example? Maybe I have an interest in a field um, around caregiving or helping others. So these are also interesting cues. Um, and mm. again, it's about taking the time out to, to think about these things a little deeper. If you don't necessarily have the funds available to be completing psychometric assessments. No, thank you for that that authentic advice and insight to everybody. So powerful and just again goes back to, you know, making sure you're centered and self-aware and documenting that as you go. And and I just love uh, the students in this community because they also keep me honest. And if I've missed a question, they remind me. Uh, so Sonnet reminded me that we didn't get to this very important question, which I think probably touches back to the rights and responsibilities that we mentioned earlier. And we've had Melissa Ardendorf previously talking in detail about student mental health issues and how we can tackle that and, you know, 
know, develop increased self-awareness, if we are going through the types of challenges that, you know, might trigger, you know, mental health issues. But how do you relate that back then, Natasha, to, you know, the psychometric sort of aspects that we're talking about today? Okay, so I think, you know, coming back to the ethics around the profession, there are definitely um, psychometric assessments that can diagnose mental health problems. But when you are completing assessments that have been purposed for um, use in an organizational context, these are not assessments that are used to diagnose or address any mental health concerns. Um, and you know, there have been instances where I've picked up um, strands of perhaps mental health concerns, not necessarily through an assessment, but you know, it comes back just to building relationships with your clients and approaching these things with um, with, with with strict ethics. You know, I I wouldn't um, so one of the things I would make sure, and again, students, if you are required to complete assessments, and I say get a good night's sleep, make sure you're hydrated, but also just make sure that you are in the right frame of mind, because it is going to impact and influence how you complete an assessment. You know, I've, I will often uh, say to a client, if, and I will ask the question, is there anything going on in your life right now that is going to impact and influence how you are going to answer the questions in this assessment? Um, and, you know, I've had clients saying, well, I'm actually going through a tough time in terms of a relationship. I didn't sleep all night. Um, I'm, I'm going through something quite difficult. So we go, okay, well, let's take a pause. Let's do it when you can complete it. And it also, thank you so much for that question, because it also brings me to the point of taking ownership. If there are anything, um, so firstly, if, if there's something going on in your life, it's your responsibility to let the recruiter know, to let the person who's assessing you know that there is, you know, I've, I've, I've maybe recently lost a loved one and I'm not in the right frame of mind, or I'm actually just not feeling well. I'm, 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 I'm a little bit under the weather at the moment. I've taken some medication that's going to impact how you complete yeah. the assess. Um, and then when it comes to things like if you have, um, if, if you are aware of a particular disability, so for example, you know, color blindness, for example, if that's going to impact how you're completing the assessment, let the recruiter know. Because if um, recruiters and, um, you know, psychometrists are aware of some of these things, in certain instances, some adjustments can be made for you to complete um, that that assessment. But you know, just being panicked and not saying anything and hoping that you're going to do um, your your best is is actually a disservice to yourself. Wonderful, Natasha. Thank you so much. And I think just you know reemphasizes what we've said on these sessions previously that you've got to take ownership of that process, and you've got to drive it. And you don't have to be you know just absolutely totally subservient to every step. If it's not going to work for you, if there's mental health concerns that you have, or if it's not convenient for your diary at that time, just manage it with the recruiter. They're not going to think anything less of you. In fact, they're probably going to respect you and see that ownership as something that is valuable in terms of the role that you might play in the company in the future. So um, certainly lots of great feedback coming through from everybody today. Um, absolute pleasure to, to have um, you guys with us today and uh, wonderful to have the insights from Natasha. And I think we've given her details there previously. So do hop onto her website, drop her an email, uh, book a call, you know, get you know more detailed you know, insights and input to your specific situation uh, so that you can be successful. And once again, just please do subscribe to the YouTube channel because any of the questions that we haven't answered today, you know, we'll maybe make some smaller videos and just pop that out onto the YouTube channel. And uh, I'm certainly going to go and have a look at Natasha's website because I think there's a lot of useful insights there that can just, I think, complement, you know, what we've discussed today and take it to a deeper level. And I saw she had a really good model there about how you approach the world of work. And that can give you guys, I think, additional ways of thinking about, um, you know, what we've been talking about today. Great to have Mara Lee today uh, from uh, Pretoria University, and uh, she given some advice there for people who are needing uh, input, and uh, she just emphasized there, do not miss the LinkedIn session next week. So we've seen how LinkedIn can be so uh, powerful for helping you guys get jobs. And again, as part of that overall job search strategy, Good that we've learned about psychometrics today because that's a step in the process, but then there's a wider strategy of profiling um, companies that you want to work for, recruiters that are out there looking for skills that you may have to offer, and then also building
building up your own network and your own profile so that you're positioning yourself uh, for the world of work out there as well. Um, so, Natasha, any last thoughts from yourself? Sonnet, good. <laughs> Thanks for letting us know that we did answer your question there about mental health. And, and guys, just I did pop the link in the chat to the previous mental health webinar that we had with Melissa Ardendorf, where we focused on mental health issues uh, for students specifically. So go check out that webinar. It really was one of our most popular webinars. And Melissa has some great insights there about mental health. Natasha, last thoughts you know, from your side about psychometrics. And I just really want to thank you for your time today and uh, remind everybody to get in touch with you after the session. Take action, guys. You know, we really are all about taking action here at the Student Success Coach. But last thoughts uh, from your side, Natasha. Yeah, I mean, I think it's exactly what you've said, Peter. It's just to take ownership, be intentional, um, create your career on purpose. And, you know, one last thing, once you've completed the assessment, if you've done it, pop the recruiter an email, say, I've actually completed the assessment to make sure that they know you've done it. And um, it's also just, you know, uh, being being an active participant in the process. And many organizations will offer you feedback regardless of your success because this will give you insight into your strengths and areas for improvement and you know any further development. Um, and if feedback is not sort of you know readily offered, ask if it can be made available. So yeah, I think like you said, Peter, you know, it's not just about necessarily taking a subservient role, it's 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 taking ownership um, in an assertive and a respectful, in a respectful manner because it's the more information that you are armed with, the more informed decisions you can make around navigating and directing your career. And I think let's, that is such a powerful point there because, Natasha, people can only be confident to the degree that they have the information that they need. And sometimes yeah. they lack the confidence in dealing with a recruiter because they maybe don't understand the process or they don't understand what the employer is trying to do. And hopefully today we've unlocked a little bit of insights around psychometrics. So when that step comes up in the process, they've got more confidence because they've got the insights and the knowledge from your expertise and wisdom and experience that you provided us today. So, Natasha, I really want to thank you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, we've had just wonderful feedback about the session today. Uh, so Zorta says there, thank you so much for the work that you do, Peter. Thank you so much for the informative session, Natasha. So pleasure, guys. Uh, you know, this is what we do here every week. I've posted the link to uh, the LinkedIn session for next week. Uh, so please do join us. The link, you don't have to write that down. The link is in the chat there. And when you hop onto any of the webinars, just click the little button there that says send, set reminder and you'll get a reminder. And of course, if you come into the Facebook group and you subscribe to the WhatsApp broadcast or Telegram channels, I always do send you a link uh, just to remind you about an hour before the session. So you'll never miss anything that's going to be helpful to you uh, to be successful. Natasha, lots of comments and compliments coming back uh, on the chat. Thank you. Have a good weekend. And to everybody that's joined us, stay safe and healthy and warm out yes. there. Cheers, Natasha. Thank you so much, Peter. And thanks, guys.